So the story starts about a quarter century ago. Sister Beatrice and Brother Seth, would you be kind to share with us what happened? Um, what happened, you know, as a young couple, we are so happy together, and then God planted a seed in us, which we were so excited. And by that time, my husband was a lab technician, and when we realized that, um, actually, I didn't even know I was expecting, <laughs> but I don't know how he realized that I was expecting. He just told me, you know, I think we need to give tests. So then when we did the pregnancy test, he did it. It was positive. We were so excited. We thanked God. I remember we, we were in Ethiopia and uh, we knelt beside the bed, thanking God for giving us a seed. And just then from there, when I was like three months pregnant, I was in church. So we stood up, you know, when, they were, when we were told it was announced that let's sing this song and stand up, we should all sing. I stood up and I felt like I'm almost to pass out. Mm. I was like dizzy, it's like blackout, it's like, this is strange. So quickly I sat down. My husband looked at me and said, can you stand up? I said, no, I'm not feeling okay. So then there were strange feelings. Of course, I had other signs and symptoms of pregnancy, but this was an additional strong feeling. So I went to the hospital. At that time, I was the nursing director. And so I decided to take the test myself uh, for ECG. I just went to the technician to do the ECG for me and went to present the ECG to the doctor. So I told him, please, I have this, this documentation. I haven't been feeling well. Can you help me? So then he looked at it. He looked at it again. Then he said, um, is this your ECG? So I said, yes. Uh, this is, you are not going to be committed after delivery is not compatible with life. So I asked him, what do you mean? What do you mean especially? So then he said, um, I mean, after delivery, you may die. So he just plainly told me like that. I was crushed just from there. Because, you know, as a young girl, and I like children, I always wanted to have a child. And here I am, I have, uh, I have a seed, so excited. Now I'm told I'm going to die. I'm not going to take care of that child. Mm. That child is going to live in this world without the mother. Mm. What do you mean, doctor? So I, I followed him again. He said, I'm telling you, you are not going to be committed. Mm. This is incompatible with pregnancy. Wow, what a blow. What a bullet in my heart. I looked for my husband. He came home, I told him the story. I cried to him. He said, hey, where is your faith? Mm -hmm. And at that time, I examined myself. I looked at it that my, my faith really is so little. Mm -hmm. But still, I lost it. Mm -hmm. I lost it. I couldn't think even that time there is a God that can do all kinds of things in somebody's life. I believe the doctor. When you are sick, we run to the doctor, even though you know there's a God. Mm. So I ran to the doctor, and I believed the doctor. Mm. So he told me I'm, I'm not going to be there. So I was really heartbroken. I saw myself as a casket mm -hmm. every time. I looked at my family back at home. I'm the only educated child. And if there is help that they get is from us. And now my mother, that time we're in Ethiopia, my pa I'm a Zambia, and um, my parents are in Zambia. And do you think of your parents receiving a casket at the airport of a child that they love most? 
a child who is like, to them, is a breadwinner. A child who is like helping everything. And if there is like a child who makes a family strong, and here she is coming in a casket. I saw my parents dying too. Mm. I saw everybody else being, you know, um, devastated with my death. Mm. To other people, I know you don't, ma you know, they don't care about your life, but to other people, you are very special. Mm -hmm. To my husband, he is my husband. I love him so much, so much. But honestly, I know if I die, he's going to marry somebody else. So, so I was like, <laughs> is that woman going to take care of my child? Mm. <laughs> so that was my worry. Honestly, I reached at the point we had a very uh, good housemaid. I reached at the point where I started thinking, when I'm going to die that day, I'm going to plead for him to marry her. I started training that housemaid to how to feed the child. I bought food. A child is not yet born. Hmm. I bought food put in a freezer so that when, the when I'm not there, this house girl knows what kind of food to give and when to give it. And so um, I bought clothes, <laughs> different sizes, <laughs> because I just wanted my child to be safe, my child to be taken care of. And the only person that I know who really take care of my child, even when I'm dead, is my housemate. Mm. I never mentioned to my husband this. I think he's hearing for the first time. Mm. So, um, I was always crying to him. We were praying. And there was a point where I think it was too much psychologically for him too. So he told me, you know, you have no idea how much it's affecting you. You need to trust God. He's the one who knows when somebody's life is going to end. He's not God. He's just a doctor. And then I realized, oh, I have to stop disturbing him. My bathroom became my prayer, my prayer room. So I was going in the bathroom every time, just kneel down, lock myself there. I know my husband will not see me. My housemates will not see me. Nobody will see me there. When you go in the bathroom, nobody knows what you are doing. <laughs> so I'll just close the bathroom and kneel down and pray. Pray for God to intervene. Mm. And even if that I'm going to die, but he has to intervene for my unborn child. I need my child to be taken care of. And so we kept on fighting on that one. We kept on praying about it. And then the day of delivery, I know that now this is my last day. So when I went to the hospital, everybody knew. People encouraged me to go back to my home. My friend told me, you know, it will be easier if you just go home and deliver there. If anything happens, let it happen there. And it made sense, actually, because we were in a foreign country and we were there as missionaries. And so it takes a lot to transport a dead body. It takes a lot to travel with a dead body. And so people sat down. Um, advised me, and I was like, let God do his will. I'm asking him. And then the verse that I really like was Matthew 7, verse 7. If ever you knock, the door will be opened. If you ask, especially when it says, if you ask, you will be given. Lord, I'm asking for my life. I'm asking. For my child, I'm asking for my husband. So if there's a God there, let him hear me. But I was still going off in my mind, I'm going to die. The doctor said it. They know it. They're educated. They went to school. They, they can tell you this will happen. You believe it. So the day comes, I'm in labor. Um, in that time, I think my husband was called in the hospital. I was alone. Water broke. 
At first, I'd, even though I'm a midwife, <laughs> at first it confused me. <laughs> I thought maybe I peed myself. <laughs> so I was like, let me clean up so my husband doesn't come and make jokes on me. <laughs> and then I was like, no, I think this is different. So then I called for him. Then we just rushed to the hospital and people surrounded us because they, they, they knew the story. Outside the hospital, there are so many people waiting. The end result of it, waiting, you know, how will it be? Praying even. Um, I was prepared and being a nurse, they are bringing all these machines and you know, all oh, that is a suction machine, all oh, that is ox oxygen, all oh, that is this and I'm like, oh, every time you conduct a delivery, we don't bring those things closer, but they knew what the doctor told me, they knew the expectation that my life would just snip off. Mm. So they had already brought all those uh, uh, machines to, to help me if anything happens. Well, they, they examined the baby. They examined me. They said um, there's a fetal distress. Mm. And we cannot allow to go forward for delivery because the baby is not breathing well. And so uh, we, they started preparing now for surgery, C-section. And when the surgery started, I knew I was looking at all the data to see how my life will start dropping. So when I look around, they gave me spine, I was able to see, I was able to talk, and I could move my head around, okay, my blood pressure is like this, okay, I'm breathing like this, okay, this is my pulse rate. I think I still have life. Mm -hmm. And then the baby is born. Mm. I hear the baby crying, they bring the baby to my chest. I was so happy that at least I could see. I looked at my baby, so beautiful. Mm. How should I live this precious? child precious life mm. and then i'm gone there she goes all over the world by herself i was hurt just to look that life that i'm looking at that now i'm going to die <laughs> so but anyway um surgery was done everything was done i stayed like um i think it was like two days in the hospital I was discharged and I still have life. And then after a month, I got better. I went back to work. I still have life. I was like, God, how long am I going to live? And uh, it was haunting me throughout my life that, hmm, maybe I'll just drop and die. Maybe it's just a matter of time. Maybe I have no idea. But I think maybe God is giving me time. I remember praying, God, take my life away when my child knows what she's doing, when she has the right choices, that when she knows what is bad and what is good. If you are ready for me that time, now that my child knows, then I'm ready to die. At least I know my child knows what to do. She's able to take care of herself. And th that affected me a lot. I cried a lot. I prayed a lot. I disturbed my husband a lot. There was a time I had to tell my, I, there was a time that I had even written a message for the pastor who is going to officiate my funeral. Mm. Mm. I told my family about it. Um, it was very disturbing. Mm. And I wish the doctors, some of these things should be reserved to the patient because it, it, it can make them go into a mental problem. Mm. Mm. It can make them have, um, affect their way of life. Mm. But I was strong. I was a fighter. And I'm glad that the man I married has been with me putting up with all these things. The rough time that I went through, he was able to stand up for me in everything, in everything. Mm. And so 
We let, decided to let me let me ask uh, okay. El Elder <laughs> Seth. Your young bride is pregnant for the first time. She comes home telling you she's incompatible with life. What goes through your mind and how did you deal with that? It was a very difficult situation. Now, for the context, where we were, there was no other hospital where you could even seek um, second opinion. He, that doctor was the only doctor at that moment. There was another surgeon who was on leave at that time. And so all we had was to actually cry to God. And, and that's what we did. Now, I knew, first of all, that God would not send us out there in Ethiopia for us to suffer. That I knew. I also knew that God brought us together for a purpose. I don't know what that purpose was, but I knew that it was not just getting together as a husband and wife. And so what I told her was that we need to seek the guidance of God. Now, when the second surgeon, the, sec the surgeon came, we approached him. His answer was a bit reassuring. You know, he was the calm guy who, even if it's bad, he will make you feel a little better. And so that gave me actually some hope. Mm -hmm. But I felt that another independent somebody has to look at it. So we went to Zambia for a vacation. So it was Ghana. And we made sure that we saw the best cardiologist in the country, who, by the way, happened to be from Ghana. And so I told him in my language that I want his best opinion. He needs to tell me what it is. Well, he said, well, it's a problem, but it's not a problem that everybody who has that problem will die. And so with that, I knew that there was a 50-50 chance. Now, from that cardiologist, that is where we had a family meeting in Zambia, where the family had to be told that this is the issue, because we didn't know what the outcome was. But to be honest with you, God had always been there, even in the stressful moments. It was not a, it was not a little thing because places we have been, honestly, we did not have any family member. In Ethiopia, there was no family member that you can say, well, here's my uncle, my auntie that could provide you with support. Even in this country, we don't have any family member. What we have is God, our church family, friends, colleagues, that's what we have. Mm -hmm. And when you have God on your side, there is really nothing to mm. worry. Mm. I personally think that sometimes we worry a lot mm. that we don't have to because we have God on our side. And so when delivery came, for her to deliver. In fact, she was in labor for probably, what, 24 hours or something? Mm -hmm. The baby was not coming. Mm. Fetal distress came in, as she mentioned. And I remember I was left alone to make a decision, either to go and do C-section or what i mean and i remember very well in the room where i was in that corner that i had to decide for the life of my wife and i remember a voice coming to my mind to say you know what it's better to save the mother not that i didn't love the baby but i knew that we could always make another baby that much i knew 
but I was torn between waiting when fetal distress was going down and to see what happens. And I'm glad I made that decision that doctor, let's go in and do the C-section for the purpose of saving her. Because the doctor told me to the least we can save her. But the baby, the way things are going, we didn't know what was going on because the fetal distress was going on very, very low. And I said, let's go and do it. I mean, very boldly, I, did, I mean, I felt like, okay, now I'm making a decision for life here. What if something goes wrong? What am I going to tell her parents that I made this decision because I had to make that decision. There was nobody that had to make that decision. I was there in the room, saw everything, and thank God, the mother and the baby were saved. Mm -hmm. If we had delayed a little bit, we were going to lose the baby mm -hmm. because there was a knot, true knot, that was going to happen. And according to the midwives and the gynecologists, that's not a good thing. If you force natural delivery, when the baby had a true knot, on the, you could mm -hmm. actually strangulate that child. And so that was, for me, the second moment where I saw God in the lead. Mm -hmm. Now with that, how do we move forward? And then came Amma, mm -hmm. the second pregnancy. What was going through your mind? The doctor had already deemed you incompatible with life once with the first pregnancy. Now you have a second pregnancy. Um, as I said before, the, I love children. I just have that kind of uh, love for them. In fact, my best friends is like the, the kids. I always wanted to be the mother. I wanted actually to have eight children if possible. Mm. I even told him when we got married, I want to have eight. And he said, I only want one. <laughs> so um, I asked God to have more kids before there was this problem. And so then he, when we saw that cardiologist and uh, talked to him at length, and then I remember asking him, so you said that uh, I'm okay. Do you think I'll be able to survive with second pregnancy? Because the first one I was told already that after delivery I'm going to die. So uh, to take that risk, is it the one that is going to take my life or what? So he said, no, you can have as many children as you want. I was shocked with that response. I started thinking about it and praying about it. My husband really didn't want to have any other child because I think what he went through, he, he didn't want to go through again. <laughs> so um, he just kept on, no, just one child. And so we tried to use other means to, um, n for me not to get another baby, but I just didn't want it. I refused it. Then I was like, okay, we just have to th thank God about it and move on with our faith. I got pregnant. I didn't know what my husband was going to tell me. We got the test positive. Told my husband, he said, you know what? This is God's plan. He did it for us, for the first one. He is going to do it again. We need to kneel down before him. That's all we need to do. Don't think of many other things. So, and I was happy I was pregnant. And I was like, God, I'm putting my life in your hands. Mm -hmm. You gave me the first one. I see the child looking so cute. I'm talking to her. I need another one. <laughs> I was happy. I, was, I took that courage, I think. What that other doctor said, 
I can have as many as I want, I'll take his word. So when I, when I became pregnant of one, I was happy. Then I moved on. But what I did was not to see another doctor to disturb my mind. I didn't want to see anybody. Thank God that I'm a midwife. I decided to do my own checkups. I'll just tell, you know, because that time maybe I, was, I had the privilege being the uh, director of nurses. And I was the boss. So I'll just write my own test. Hey, can you do my blood work? I need this test, I need that test. And my husband was a lab technician that time. Things were easy. He would just do the test. He sees the results are okay. And so where it comes to see, you know, there was a time where you have to see the position of the baby. Is the baby alive? Is the baby what? I was doing it myself. I'll get the fetoscope from the um, OB. I'll get all the equipment. I'll go home. I'll start examining myself. I could do check the baby, the baby is okay. I didn't want to see a midwife. I didn't want to see the doctor. I didn't want any negative from anybody except my husband. I was buying big dresses so that nobody sees that I'm pregnant. So it went on, it worked well. I could do tell, okay, the baby's butt is on this way, the baby's head is this way, the baby is like this, the baby is breathing, the, I mean, the heartbeat is this way, I'm good. <laughs> the baby is good, I thank God. So that's what I was doing until delivery. Then I went to the hospital for delivery. So the baby was good, everything was good. The same procedure of C-section, I was seeing myself all the vital signs, I'm fine. Did C-section. She had, we had another incident also for cord around the neck. The first baby, that was the problem for fetal distress. She had the cord around the neck. That's what caused fetal distress. And we almost lost a life. But C-section was done on time for Ajwa. Then for Ama was the worst because she had twice around the neck and then around her tummy and around the leg and she made a true knot and what it means if it is a true knot once there is traction when the baby goes down the pelvis it ties the knot to cut off circulation between the mother and the baby so um it also during labor the head was not going down so the doctor said there is no progress. We have to take her for C-section. And also, she has also uh, fetal distress. So when they did C-section, the doctor said, you know, you people, you are, you are very prayerful. We were going to lose this baby. Almost to lose this baby. Mm. Just seconds. Just the way that the, the, the cord was already tying tight. Mm. It was just exactly that time the baby was saved. Mm. And got discharged, got okay, went back to work. Now, when the third child came in, when third pregnancy, um, I think that time we decided not to have. I had enough. <laughs> <laughs> My opposition for more children was at the highest point. So I said, after Amma, that is it. In fact, because I saw C-section for the first one, Ajwa, saw the way things went. Amma, I saw it again. I said, no. <laughs> so I was worried for her. Now, she wanted eight children, by the way. That was her criteria. Well, I was settling at one. Now, number two. So I said, no. No. So we went to this same doctor to do uh, tubal ligation yeah. so that we don't have any more children. We went to this doctor and he looked at me and said, you know what? I'm not going to do it. 
you are very young, and I've seen these cases that later on people regret because mm -hmm. something happened, you know, so I am not going to do it. No, <laughs> no discussion. I mean, some of you may be thinking, you know, how can that be if you want it? Who is the doctor to say no? We had no option. The no doctor choice. says no, it is no. We went home very, very sad, <laughs> honestly <laughs> speaking. <laughs> and, you know, we tried everything that we could to prevent more pregnancies. So one day, we were traveling. That time, Ajua was probably three. From nowhere, from nowhere, Ajua asked, in the, you know, we're in the car, Mommy, why don't we have a baby brother? She was comparing herself with the other missionaries that we have on, on, on campus. She started mentioning names. You know, this family, they have a brother. This one has a brother. Why don't we have a brother? <laughs> and the mom said, oh, Ajua, it is God who provides brothers. Mm. Ajua said, then I'll pray to this God <laughs> to give us a brother. To be honest, and I have a videotape of Ajua praying. When, we, when they were kids, they were the ones who were praying when we want to eat. From that time, Ajua will pray. Dear God, bless the food. Also give us a baby brother and a boy. <laughs> that was her prayer. I mean, consistently. That was Ajua's prayer. I got up one day. I looked at her. I said, I think you are, pre you are pregnant. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what, but I told her, I think you are pregnant. Yeah. Give me your urine. She gave me the urine. I went to the lab. I tested it positive. <laughs> so now the question is, what do we do next? What I know, I'm not a gynecologist or a midwife, but I know because I heard it from the doctors on Amma's pregnancy, something they call tri scar fest. It means if a woman had that first C section, during the second delivery, you try for her to deliver naturally before you go to the second C section or whatever it is. We tried that, it didn't work. So, but I heard also from these doctors that third C-section, a third pregnancy is a must to have C-section. So if you had C-section, the first one, and had it the second one, the third one is a must. So that was problem number one. Problem number two, she has this heart problem. We know it is there. And there were complications alongside with this pregnancy. I mean, lots of complications. We were at the hospital where it was very limited. Many things were limited. Mm -hmm. I had to do IV solutions at the hospital for her to have IV for this surgery. There was no anesthesia um, um, medication. A Catholic student tapped on my shoulder one day and said, I think I want to go to my hospital and get um, anesthesia um, um, medication. Otherwise, she was going to go through an I mean, C-section without mm. any anesthesia. We had no other way. Mm -hmm. This guy walked probably maybe what easy 10 hours mm. to go to his hospital and get one vial of lidocaine and brought it mm. in order for this to happen. Mm. So we went through this episode of issues. Every day there was an issue. But the highlight of that for me was when she was almost 
to deliver. I believe this was in July. Mm -hmm. In August, usually at that part of the world, all the roads from the capital city to the hospital is closed. I mean, mm -hmm. no, no transportation. And I remember somebody that I respect visited us in the hospital and he advised us, you know what, this is what missionaries do here. They go out and have their babies. So on my way out to the, to the union, I'll make arrangement for you to go out of the country and have your baby because in August the road was going to close. I was troubled. So I called her to the room. In front of our bedroom is our prayer corner. I mean, in the bed, in front of the bed is our prayer. So I called her to the bedroom and said, let's pray. I told her I was not very comfortable for us to leave the country and go and have our baby. The reason was that we, she's a midwife, I was a lab technician. We've seen people walking eight hours with their babies hanging to come to the hospital. We've seen those. And now it is your time. So you leave and go and have your cozy baby and come back and tell them we love you. It troubled me. And I said, God, is in control. He will take care of it. He will do it. Mm. And that is when all these lidocaine and IV solutions and all those things came up. The day that some kind of contraction started, we wanted to have an elective C-section. Meaning, in fact, I wanted Michael to be born on Friday <laughs> because I was born on Friday. So we kind of staged it, right? And we decided to go and opt for an elective C-section. So we went to the doctor. That time we had a new surgeon. We went to him and said, doctor, we want C-section on this day, which was, I think it was Wednesday. We wanted it on Friday, so that at least we have one day to prepare. He said, okay, let's examine the baby. <laughs> he put her on the, on the bed, examined, and he called another doctor to come and so they can put their heads together. They concluded that Michael was premature. In fact, that made me upset because I was very sure that he was due. It was like, you miscalculated, right? So I was, so because of that, because of their assessment that he was premature, they could not do the elective, elective C-section. We went home very sad. So I told her, you know what, let's go for a walk. This was on Thursday. Let's go for a walk. So we had to walk from our house. There was a little hill that we had to descend to go and, um, you know, there was a garden. And so we were going to walk by the garden. Now, when we were coming back to our house, Amma would not walk. Amma would not make, Amma says, unless you put me at her back, there was a term she used, papu. <laughs> so when Amma says papu, means she wants at the back. So, she was pregnant. Ajua could walk a little bit. Amma would make two steps and she would just stand there. I'm not going until I go. <laughs> she would cry. And Amma used to cry. <laughs> so I was called an emergency to go to the hospital. So I left them. I left them, the two of them. So as they were coming, she realized that contraction had started. I went to the hospital and probably an hour and a half later, I was called to come to the hospital imme immediately. I rushed there 
and that was my wife, ready be to, to be taken to the operating room. I rushed home. I don't even know how I got there because I wanted to get my camera and film the whole thing because this was, these were the doctors that believed that Michael was seven months. And now it's an emergency. So I rushed home, I got my camera and recorded the whole thing. I was interested in two things. One, the gender. Is he a boy or a girl? <laughs> now, before then, we wanted to make sure, because Ajwa was so serious on the baby boy thing, and Ajwa knows, because that's what we've been telling her, that if you cry to God, if you pray to God, God always answers prayer. Mm -hmm. So that's all she knew. So I told her, why don't we find out from Ajwa? What will she do if it's another girl? So in the evening, we called Ajwa and said, hey, Ajwa, your mom is going to have a baby. So what, 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 what will happen if it's another girl? Ajwa's answer was, then leave her in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one of the reasons really why we wanted to do the elective C-section so that we know it and it shouldn't be a surprise to everybody. So I was very curious as to the gender of this baby. Secondly, I wanted to know if it's a premature baby. And why I wanted to know was that if it was a premature baby with the conditions that we had at the hospital at that time, lack of resources, it was going to be a serious, a serious business. Hey, lo and behold, C-section was done, and it was a boy. Mm. And so, all these tell me, as we go through these, uh, you know, episodes of stressful moments, that God is still in control. Mm. Human beings, we may have our own ways of interpreting things, but unless God says or allows it, it is not going to work. And that is what I've learned all these years. So Michael was born, and of course, there were issues with Michael. Michael got his name Michael because we were doing telemedicine with a doctor in Oregon called Michael Cheek. So she had a lot of complications, you know, swelling of feet and all kinds of issues with the heart and all those things. So this doctor came in there to our hospital as a missionary for a short period of time. We explained to him, he said, no, I'll help you guys. So we do the lab test, we send it to him. He will tell us what we need to do. And so we decided it was a great honor if we could name Michael after Michael Chick. Now, Sister Beatrice, you have Already, be de already been deemed incompatible with life before the first pregnancy. You had three children, but the story doesn't end there. No. The situation, the condition you had with your heart continued to develop somewhere in the background and it resurfaced later on. It resolved, or at least it was brought to some conclusion most recently. Mm -hmm. What happened? Um, what happened actually, you know, with a heart problem of all signs, or you're having like um, weakness, and then you find that sometimes uh, you feel like a little bit um, like you are almost too faint or something like that. So I went to see the doctor, and then he recommended to see the cardiologist and they have been following the cardiologist and he, he did a lot of tests and uh, there was a time actually that they also wanted to put a pacemaker because my heart rate was dropping. So I remember my husband when he was going to UK, I was scheduled to, to have the pacemaker be put and he had to come from UK. 
uh, in that time, I had stayed in the hospital, I think, around three days or so. And then they scheduled the day to do the pacemaker procedure. And then when the doctor, well, I mean, the crew from the operating room came so that they can now put the pacemaker. I mean, they prepared me, everything was done. So they came to pick me up. And then the doctor showed up just that time and said, wait, we have to do one more test before she goes for the procedure. And that time I had a lot of fears. And at the same time, I was, give, I was thanking God for giving me time, looking at the age of the children. I know that they can move on with life. And with this heart problem, God has given me really good time. I thank him. So it didn't hit me so much because I also prayed before that God helped me to reach a certain age. And I was uh, saying, you know, at least if the children are like, you know, knowing where to make choices and maybe they are in 20s or when, you know, then take my life away if mm -hmm. that is your will. And now this time I have the heart problem. I'm going through these procedures. I think now may be the time. I don't know. This heart now is coming back. I have the key. I had the problem with the children and now it's hitting me back, but let it be. Let God do his will. So I remember the doctor coming in and stopping them from taking me to the operating room. Let us do the stress test first. And if she passes that stress test, then the procedure is going to be on hold. And if it is still going to show the problem, then she has to be taken for a pacemaker. Lord behold, I went for that procedure, I mean, for that test. He came back and told me that we are not going to do that pacemaker. And I had the fear of that pacemaker because I was not ready. I could feel it myself, I was not ready for it. And I saw myself like I'm just too young to be carrying this pacemaker. Mm -hmm. Because I've not seen anyone at, uh, with my age, with my profession as a nurse, I haven't seen anyone with a pacemaker. I see it in elderly people. So why me at this age? And I feel like I'm strong. I feel like I don't think I'm ready to have this kind of uh, instrument in me. Mm. But hey, the doctors know what they are doing. Let them do what they want to do. And I just pray to God, whatever he can to intervene, and let him be in the doctors. Not the doctors doing the procedure, but God doing the procedure for me. Mm. And so then um, when the doctor told me, I knew that God was not into it for me to have that procedure. He's still giving me more time. So the procedure was canceled and then I was discharged. There's a lot of times that my body has been wired, you know, trying to examine my heart. The toughest time, it was in uh, 2020, right? When the doctor, um, this particular time, I was preparing to go to Africa to see my parents. They were not doing very well. And, uh, um, I remember that day my husband told me, you know, tomorrow I'll be buying your ticket. So if we, everything is okay, I'll be buying a ticket for you to go to Zambia, to go see the parents. So, and then I had the doctor's appointment that day. So when I went to see the doctor, he had done the test before. And so when I saw that doctor, he told me, oh, your heart is not in the right place. Mm. It's very serious. Um, and uh, your function right now of your heart is at 25%. And 
and uh, you don't have to leave the country. You need to stay within. So I tried to ask the doctor how serious it was because I'm planning really to go see my family. So he said, I think you need to wait. So it was very, very scary the way he explained to me. Oh, I went out of that doctor's office. Now I knew that that's it. I usually don't go to my husband's office unless there is really something. I walked to his office. My face dropped. Everything was shattered. And I told him, this is what the doctor told me. So my husband had to communicate with uh, the children. We had an emergency meeting in the loft trying to explain the situation, you know, my heart may stop any time. And tried to encourage the children, encouraging everybody else, life must go on. In case I go, life must go on. We know we do not have family members here, but anybody who comes to you positively, that one is a family member. Stick to them. Um, there was a lot of crying, a lot of crying, a lot of crying, and a lot of prayers. Ajwa, I remember she said, Mommy, you are going to take care of my grandchildren. You are going to take, uh, sorry, not my, my grandchildren. She said, Mommy, you are going to take care of my children. You are going to take care of your grandchildren. You are not going to die. Then Michael could tell mommy, I think the doctor has told you before like that. I don't see my life without mommy. I think you will be okay. And then Ama, you know, she was like, mommy, I think you'll be fine. We just need to keep on praying. My husband, he encouraged everyone strongly. The doctor have told us a lot before, and the doctor is telling us again now, we need to keep our faith that has kept us from the beginning until now. That's all we need to do. We need to keep on praying and stay focused, stay strong. If it happens, it happens. Everybody has to be strong. It's the worst thing to, <laughs> to see your family falling apart in that way. And to see the reaction of each one of them, that broke my heart. Mm. That I was praying to God to give me more time, even though before I prayed, until the time they know, they know what choices they could make. But now they know. They are, they are college students. And here I am, I don't want to go. I want to. <laughs> I still want to be with them. It, it really brought my spirit down that I will not be there when they are doing graduations. I'm not going to be there when they will be walking in that aisle. I'm not going to be there taking care of their children. I'm not going to be there when they are struggling with life. I'm not going to be there when they are like, you know, having their own children, at least you go and help them out in that process. When I think like that, then you know, I start praying for God to give me more time again. But if God says, okay, this is the day, this is the day, I need to accept it. I started to accept my condition the way it is. I remember talking to one of the deaconesses, and if the, I'm sure if this, this deaconess may even remember what I told her, please, I want you to be around me if anything happens. Because I know I don't have mother here, I don't have father here, I don't have auntie or whatever, I don't have anybody except my children and my husband. I need somebody I can really cling, who can be really watch around. And uh, the other thing also, which uh, um, 
when I talked to my, my, my kids, they were like, Mommy, we'll stay strong when time comes. And we wish your barrier is here. Because here we can be in control. If it is back home, we are not in control. We'll be just following everybody like that. Whatever they say, we do it. And then uh, we, just say, okay, we just need to pray about it. So then I started thinking, you know, if just in case my body is going to be buried here, I need to talk to somebody who stay around my casket all the time aside to my husband, who is a woman. I didn't talk a lot to that woman, but I, to that deaconess, I just wanted to tell her a lot when now I know that my life is over. No reverse. Then I'm going to empty myself to this person. But what I just told her a little bit was just, just be around me in case this is the issue I'm going through. I didn't talk in details. I just talked just that little bit so that she can prepare. Um, and I also told her, I think this is the one that I want to do my, 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 my officiating my funeral if it happens here. Now, that was last year. Now, a, a year later, you're mm -hmm. still here. How yes. Come? So now, with all this, we stopped everything, stopped the journey to go to Africa, canceled most of the things. So then um, he said, we have to do the testing again in uh, three months. So we did the test. That was in May 20, 2020, in May. He did the test and said, oh, it went up actually. It's now like 30%. So if we have to, we have to um, really check it again, if the heart rate is going to go below 30, we are going to do the defibrator. Mm -hmm. If it's going to be above 30, then we are going to stop it. We prayed about it, and I was afraid about it. So then we went to see the doctor. When the appointment came again, he said, I think we are going to schedule the defibrator on the 24th of, uh, it was 26, 26th of August. When I went to see the doctor, now the, your, the way your heart is, we need to put the defibrator. I didn't understand it very well, even though I was a nurse. I know about the defibrator, but now it's coming to me. What is it? <laughs> so he explained to me um, to understand that it's something that is going to be with you. If your heart stops working, it's going to shock you. Before 911 comes to you, it will be already resuscitating something. Because when you call 911, it will be too late. Mm. So this one will just give you a shock. So I was like, oh, wow. Am I at that level? <laughs> um, he explained about it. I remember there was uh, some families that came from Zambia. One of them is, is the nurse, my good friend. And I told her to come with me to that doctor's appointment with a reason that in case something happens, she is the witness and I went in that office with her. The only person from Zambia, they came for graduation. So I told her about it. So I went with her in the doctor's office and she was there when the, the doctor was telling me about scheduling the defibrator in August. So from there, I went to tell my husband that this is the issue I need to have a defibrator. My husband said, hmm, I need to talk to that doctor myself. Okay, so we scheduled the appointment with the doctor and Adjua said, I'll go with you. So we made an appointment for 15th of uh, July and the doctor went through it. And that's when I came to know that actually the defibrator is being controlled 
all over the world. They control it. If you have it in another country, you just go to the nearest. They'll come and help or give advice. So started praying about it, about how can I have this thing again? God, you do it for me. You did it for me. Three children I have. You did it for me. I couldn't have that pacemaker. You can do it again for me. There's nothing impossible. If you can give the word for the mountain to move, you can do the word for me to get better. We prayed, we prayed, with the children prayed. Ajwa will come and make sure that I'm okay. I'm, I'll come to make, you know, the children will just come. Michael will come, my husband, they're all checking on me. Every time I get up, wait, every time I sleep, they want to make sure I'm breathing, I'm okay. <laughs> But anyway, the schedule, um, it was scheduled for the defibrillator for 26 August. We were waiting for that procedure day. So he ran the test again, just to confirm before that procedure. He wanted to be 100% sure. So then, on the 24th of August, he called me. And that time now we are in pandemic. We can't see the doctor in the office. Just seeing the doctor on the video. So he called. I could see the doctor happy on the screen. How are you doing? Hey, I have good news for you. What? <laughs> good news from the doctor's office? <laughs> As far as I know, the doctors tell me a lot <coughs> what I got from the bullets I've gotten from them. And this day I was waiting for a sentence to be sentenced to death. <laughs> you know, that the, the test that you've been done, your heart has gone to the worst condition. You know, this and that, this and that. I was waiting for that sentence. And now the doctor is telling me that uh, he has good news. What is it? So do you want to hear your good news? I said, doctor, yes, I want to hear good news. You have no heart problem. What? What? Oh, I, so it just, it just became so emotional when I started thinking about it. But, oh. Doctor, I... I are you sure? Maybe it's for somebody else. I don't think it's me. So I said, um, we have done all the tests. And it is you. You do not have any problem. Your heart function is good. It's now on 45%. Ha! And all the procedure we wanted to do, and this is on the 24th now. The procedure was supposed to be on the 26th. Huh. Wow. Doctor, no, I don't think it's me. He said, no, it's, it's you. Huh. The world has changed. I thanked God for that. Even I couldn't believe it's me, but I thanked God about it. I thanked God. I remember after talking to the doctor, I went down, kneeling down, thanking God for the miracle, for the testimony he has given me. And all these things that I've gone through, what am I, what am I seeing? Mm. Whew, I told the family about it. Ajoa was like, Mama, I told you. And my husband said, you know, it's God. We serve a living God. You don't have to doubt. You just have to have a big faith. We have gone through a lot. And here we are again. God has done. Mm. So, I gave this testimony during Ajoa's graduation. The reason why I wanted, because it started with her. It started with her. And here she is. I've witnessed her life. I've seen her grow. And she's now um, practicing. No, I shouldn't say practicing. She's now a resident. Did the medicine. I can't believe what God has done in my children's life. Mm. 
even though I had that struggle, the devil came in to bring us down in so many ways. Mm. But the victory, mm. God gives in the end. Mm. And so in June this year, even though I had doubts, I'm still having, mm, this doctor, I think he made a mistake. Maybe it was, I remember thinking it's my, my sister-in-law's results because my sister-in-law, she's Beatrice Uyafe also. And when she comes here, she goes through, you know, some uh, tests or, you know, she sees doctors and they do tests and all that. So I was thinking maybe it's her. This doctor left. I didn't even know that he left. But when I called to make an appointment, uh, then I was told that the doctor left. So I was devastated. I liked him so much. And then a new doctor came in and he wants to know the baseline of my heart. So he started doing all the tests and he told me that he has done even the most sensitive uh, uh, tests that if you have any problem tagging your heart, it will pick it up. So I said, oh, okay. So I went through all those tests. And then he called me and said, you have no problem. Your heart function is on 55%. Mm. <laughs> what a God. What the love he has for Beatrice. I don't need anything else. I don't need anything else. He has done it in a big way. And that's the God we serve. I'm here standing as a walking testimony. God lives, and God provides. God answers prayers. Empty yourself to God, he will do a lot in your life. I just thank him in everything, everything. I thank my children, I thank my husband, I thank friends. There are friends that have prayed that I call, I will tell them they are praying with me on the phone. You know, people don't see a lot, I mean, they don't know a lot about somebody unless you go close to that somebody. You go to church, you have all the wires in your body, they have no idea what you are going through. But there are those that, come, that know you, they will come and pray with you. I thank them all. Mm. I thank everybody. I thank the church members being there for us. I thank pastors like you, Pastor Christian. They have been there for us, making us strong each and every day. So I want to say mm. thank you to God. Thank you to you. I want to thank my husband. This man is my hero. <laughs> you still want eight children? <laughs> <laughs>